in my life, I've seen death come as a result because someone failed to manage their diabetes. It does sadden me when my own congregation is suffering from diabetes because it's preventable. I believe taking charge of your life means being aware of your own health, getting professional advice, and then executing those things that have been provided for you. I'm Pastor Bobby Waters, and my health does matter. It's about to come. We got everything, dates, times, places, all of that. So it will be up and going starting this coming Tuesday there. All right, with that being said, I do want to let you know that uh, Judith, uh, who is the one who I've got to give crudos and, uh, what is what is it, crudos? No, not kudos, kudos, okay, not, not crudos, okay. I want to say, you know, she has been the one who has helped put this together. And as you all know, the Nebraska Health Disparity and Racial Equity, in which I've been a part of for the last 10 years, we have been working together with our community because we do know one thing. No one organization can do it all by themselves. And so I'm hoping that we will create a network, create a partnership, create a working thing that will actually help us whereby for your specialties we can send our people to, bring you here uh, to help individuals know and understand because believe it or not, I found out some very disturbing news and that is the Northeast Corridor, Omaha, where most of us live we're the highest with diabetes, hypertension. Uh, I just finished a course with chronic disease. And I tell you what, it's amazing. And you will never believe this, but even child infancy, we lead the nation in deaths. And that's because we're the last to get medical help. One of the things they found out that told me that shocked me that most of our community, the first medical providers they see are usually the emergency room. And we want, to tra we want to change that. We want to get people in and become healthy by knowing and understanding they do need a health provider working together. So without further ado, I want to have prayer and then I'm going to ask Judith Hill if she will come and she will introduce our individuals who will be here this evening. And once again, I'm Pastor Waters. You may have seen the commercial there. And I just told somebody, I got a call Thursday. They just changed uh, my thing into four languages. And I said, well, why did you do it in four languages? Uh, believe it or not, yours truly is treading the most among all the eight that were filmed and everything. So I'm in foreign language now. So, you know, uh, now, I'm still pastor, huh? <laughs> I'm still pastor. I'm still here down to earth. But pray because I want to use that as an instrument to reach individuals who do need help. So, Judith, after I have prayer, I want you to come down and introduce tonight our guests who will be with us. So let's bow our heads tonight. Father in heaven, we are so grateful once again for the opportunity of coming together. We pray, dear Lord, for your blessings to be with us. And Lord, we pray for each presenter as they come before us to share the good news of what they can provide and what we can do working together to help our community. So Lord, bless us and keep us. And above all, may it be good for all of us to have been here tonight. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's give Judith a hand. She is the one responsible for putting this together. And as she comes, I need everybody, please sign your name, whether you're a provider or whether you're just here to learn. I do need your names there. Thank you very much. Good evening. Oh, oh, I don't, answer, don't say that according to the weather outside. Good evening. Good evening. 
It is a pleasure to have you here. I am so excited for the individuals that are going to come and speak with you this afternoon. Uh, the church, we know historically the church is a place where it was more than just a, the, a sermon being provided. Uh, uh, there was a gentleman who worked in our community, Jesse Sharp, he shared with me. He said, you realize that nonprofit work came out of the church, that they would meet, they would then have lunch, and then they would leave and they would distribute and they would go out into the community and they would do and they would meet whatever the needs uh, were of the community. As time has gone on, the churches, we've become very comfortable. God has blessed us and we've become very comfortable. And we know that there are nonprofit organizations out there that do a lot of the work that before they were established, that it was oftentimes looked to the church. But the church is still the foundation of information, especially in communities of color. And so we have to be willing to take up that mantle again and to be able to share information. What I say is when these three individuals finish, you will be an ambassador. You may never have breast cancer. You would pray. You may never, ever, ever need to use Medicaid. You may never have the heartbreak of a child being a, a child being killed to violence in this community or having a daughter or a son that is involved in domestic or intimate partner or a young lady or a young man that's impacted by sexual uh, 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 trafficking. You may never, ever, ever experience that. But I'm telling you, I know you're going to run into somebody who will. And at that point, the opportunity that you have is to share information that you've learned from sessions like these with those individuals when they come across your path. We have three guests that are going to be with us here today from Peak Lotus Project, Tisa Harton Partridge. Um, Tisa, I remember we lived in the same neighborhood, and so I've watched Tisa grow up from a little girl to a beautiful woman. Uh, her, her parents, both who are now deceased, um, I was just sharing with her. Uh, when I grew up, uh, you know, being a tall, statuesque woman really wasn't a thing. You know, when you go to school every day and all the boys are shorter than you, life is not a happy place. You know, school is a miserable place to be. But her mother was tall and statuesque. And I remember when I would see her walk, she walked with such elegance and such beauty. And she made me realize there was beauty inside of me and that I needed to be proud for who I am. And this young lady basically epitomizes who her parents were. And so um, I'm gonna start with her. Uh, she had a breakfast. She is the CEO of Pink Lotus Project. They had a beautiful breakfast this morning. We had a delegation of our sisters that were there. Sisters, I honor you. Thank you so much for being there. It was just a beautiful experience and we were so glad to be able to support. She's just gonna come and tell you her testimony share her story. Gentlemen, understand, breast cancer is not just something that happens to women. It can happen to men as well. She's just going to talk with us about her story, and then we'll get some questions answered, and then we're going to let her go home, because I'm telling you, even if she doesn't admit it, she's tired. Sister Tisa, come on. Good afternoon, Sharon. How are we this afternoon? I'm a mover, so I'm going to hold this mic if I can. Uh, yes, it's been a long day, but I'm glad to be here with you guys this afternoon. Beth Ann and I go way back. You know, we d adopted Paul. Paul, we had lived four houses up the street, and so Paul would just ride his little bike up the street. And he would always stop and holler at my brother, but my, my parents took Paul in. Uh, and so Paul became a, a closer brother to me, and we did a lot growing up, um, even to, up to his passing. So I miss him dearly, but that's just to say we go way back. That's all. Um, I grew up in Clare Methodist Church. Um, we had our pancake feed there today um, from childhood on. And so uh, I've recently been attending uh, Pastor Tony Sanders Church, Quantania. Uh, so we bring you greetings from them. And Pink Lotus Project Nebraska. Pink Lotus Project Nebraska is a breast cancer support group and organization I started in 2017. I am a 11 year breast cancer survivor. Thank you. That's all praise and glory to God. What you're witnessing today is his grace and mercy. Um, God saved me, and, and he saved me to save others. Uh, I was just telling Beth, and my story is I wasn't shocked when I got breast cancer because I think God put it on my heart maybe in my 30s that I was going to get breast cancer. Um, 
I wasn't shocked at all. So for most people, it's a very shocking situation. It's a, it's a like, where did it come from? I don't have it in my family, blah, blah, blah. Um, but for me, it wasn't. So I just asked the Lord when I, I received it. I cried a little bit. I asked my father the why. And my father, both of my parents are wonderful, were wonderful parents. But it only takes a word from your father, right? And my father said, why not you? Um, step into my purpose is what he told me. Um, if I got breast cancer, and I knew I was going to get breast cancer, it's for a reason. And so I'm just here to just step into my purpose. And I started Pink Lotus because uh, in 20, 2012, there wasn't a lot of services out there for African-American women. We still die 40% more from breast cancer than any culture. And that was a shocking statistic for me. I'm like, I'm a white kid, why? Like, what are we doing wrong? Like, we die from everything, it seems like, right? We, we get the worst of everything. We get the worst breast cancer. We get the, the hard to kill breast cancer. We get the aggressive breast cancers. And so out of all the bad, 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 we get the bad of the bad of the baddest. Um, and so that, that all attributes to us uh, dying more from it. But also, we help ourselves and put ourselves in that boat. And I just, you know, I, I always try to teach people when you know better, you do better, right? Amen? And so over... I've learned a lot over the 11 years as a breast cancer survivor, and I just want to make sure that you guys pick up this information because I want to be able to leave you information that's going to help you hopefully prevent, get, prevent breast cancer. Um, this is a club nobody asked to be in, but when you're here, uh, I think the Lord has put on everybody to um, help another sister up, um, help her through the journey. Uh, we got to be here for each other through this, and, so, and also teach what we've learned so that maybe somebody else could avoid this. Um, we're all about prevention with, with Pink Lotus. Um, we're about plant-based food and healthy living, mind, body, and spirit. That's where you take a holistic approach to healing. And so um, what I found out is through my life, you can't leave out the mind, and you can't, definitely can't leave out the spirit. The spirit is what gives you hope. The spirit is what gives you courage to get up in the morning. All of that other stuff, everything else can be going on around you, but if your spirit is not checked, you have to get your spirit together. We can never leave out the mind, body, and the spirit part of the spirit. And so um, I, we just teach people to, and, and our mindset. You know, we always talk about black people don't do mental health. We don't see, get therapy. <sighs> we breaking through them walls, y'all. We all need therapy. We all need some mental health checks. Uh, why not? We, we're, the most, we're, we're the most beat down culture, right? We, we've been through it all. Why, why, why wouldn't we not need some mental health? Right? And so I don't want people to think that that's a, a, a weakness. It's actually part of our strength because we, we, we've dealt with so much. We are diligent people. We are strong people. But we also got to make sure that we can pass that strong and that diligent on to our kids. Our kids are not as strong as we are. Mentally, our kids are in trouble, y'all. I've never heard the word anxiety so much over the last five, ten years. Kids brought that up. Our kids are they have anxiety. They're depressed, you know. Um, Yes, they've dealt with some harder things, but I just, you know, I, I don't want to say they soft, but they soft. They, I, I, we, we, we've been through so much. I, I, you know, we drank from the water hose. We got lead poisoning. We didn't wear seat belts. We were in metal cars. I mean, and here we are, right? We, we all got our limbs. How did we survive? How do we survive? And now our kids are allergic to peanuts. They're allergic to this. They can't stand that. They can't even go outside in the sun. <sighs> The tablets got them like this. Social media's got them all messed up in the head. You know, there was all, there's always been bullying, but you know, social media takes that to another level. Now 3,000 people can bully you except for that one or two person in the school that was a bad kid, right? Um, and so we gotta help them navigate through all of that. First of all, tell them to put that tablet down. It, it's hard, but you know, if your daughters, or the daughters, y'all got grandkids, tell the daughters to tell them to put them tablets down. Because we got to just step up and really just take it back old school with some of these things. Some of it's just common sense and they just don't got it. Common sense ain't common with these kids. They don't know they've been on a tablet for five, no, ten hours a day when you've only been up 15. So you're on eight, slept, pooped, and been on your tablet. You know, been on your tablet. Bring back, you know, eating, cooking. Bring that kind of stuff back. Because that's the stuff that's causing us cancer. Preservatives and all these fast foods, you know. Um, and I know we love for convenience, but if we can take it back to 30-minute meals to, with Rachel Ray or something, we need to take it back to some cooking. Teach our daughters and sons how to cook. My son knows how to cook. Um, I ain't going to be around always, but he cannot live off of the preservatives and the fast foods. Um, the frozen foods, it's all about convenience, but if something can last for five years, y'all in your cupboard, that should be something like you should be like, 
hmm, like what is in there and how is it going to last till 2028 and still be the same quality? You know it's something, y'all, you know, something ain't right. You know when y'all see a chicken wing get the size of your hand, that ain't normal. We chicken eaters, right? So <laughs> I, I stopped eating time out food probably about 10 years ago. I was in the clubs. I thought, we did a Friday night chicken. I ain't no shame in my game. Um, but when they started getting big as my hand, I said, okay, Frank, well, what, what? And I stopped eating the chicken because you just got to have some common sense about it. Ain't no chicken. If his wing is this big, what's the body? And is that a chicken or a turkey? Because I'm confused at this point. So just have some common sense about what we eat. All things ain't good to eat, ain't good to eat. Um, and be more plant-based. You know, it, it's, you hear it over and over again, and people just don't want to hear it, but you hear it over and over and over again. Y'all, we are not really meant to process beef. Um, we're not meant to process an animal, and it takes your, your body a week to process a hamburger. That's just something to be like, hmm, what? Okay, and so, and it just, it just makes your body work harder. Uh, and so as you, you know, I, I'm 80-20. I, I, I'm 80% mostly, I do most of what I'm supposed to do, but that 20%, yeah, I, I still have a, I don't really eat hamburgers, but I might have a piece of fried chicken. I might have a Raisin Cane's meal. My son loves that. I'll be like, okay, dude, like we've had that once this month. He'd be like, mom, like, I, I monitor it. You got to monitor it. It's okay sometimes, but they ain't go all the time. It's not okay all the time. So don't, don't, don't beat yourself. Don't take it all off your plate, but uh, if you can back it up to the minimum, try that first. Try a no meat Monday because we're bad about our meat. We're bad about our pork and we're bad about our beef. So if we can start thinking more plant-based, I wouldn't even switch. I'd just take it out your diet. I'm, I'm, not, I'm not good with a plant-based burger. I'm not good with it. I'm not going to eat meat. I'm just not going to eat meat. You know, that's just my thing. You know, if you can switch over to those plant-based uh, burgers or whatever, start chasing them. Try it out. Might not be bad. I don't know. I ain't trying them. I'm just, I, I'm just saying I just won't eat a burger, right? I can do that. I can take that out of myself. So pick up this thing. So I want, we want to operate from a prevention mode. One of the main things that we need to do, and since churches are our base, we need to keep our families together and start having, we having those family reunions, you know, we get all kind of stuff cooked up. But those family reunions, one, it was always a health moment missing. We got the tree, we got grandma, grandpa, papa, doo doo, everybody down there. I want y'all to start adding, what did they pass of? What did, what did they die of? Natural causes, I guess you just want to be a bunch of cancer, diabetes, complications from this, complications from, and that's what we need to pay attention to. First of all, that's your lineage, and that's what's already, already in your body. We can't change that, but knowing what you know now, you start, okay, diabetes runs heavy in my family. I, I, I might need to start watching that sugar intake, and that's real. It's about how much sugar it is in your, and if you're pushing the button, doing a lot of sugar, a lot of, my daddy had a sweet tooth. Every after every meal, he would say, Laverne, what's for dessert, you know? He didn't get diabetes until he actually retired, but it was in the system. And I thought, God, he, he ain't never going to get diabetes. All the much sugar is he? He got diabetes after he retired and kind of slowed down. But it was, it, was, it was the bear waiting to be poked. All of his sisters, both his sisters had diabetes. One had an amputee. It was there, you know. So know that's there. You, if you know if your parents have died of some things, they both took high blood pressure until they both they died. I refuse to take I'm not. I don't have high blood pressure, but if they tell me I got high blood pressure, there's a problem because I make sure I maintain that, because I see both parents, I'm not going to be on high blood pressure medicine. And if you can naturally get off of high blood, how many people is on high blood pressure medicine? Anybody just want to that, that's, that's a, I'm, I'm seeing that become an epidemic um, for them, the medications and the pharmaceuticals. I, I want y'all to make sure, again, like type two, all of that could be controlled, adjusted, backed up off of just by changing your lifestyle. Don't let them put you on medication. You'll be taking another medicine for the rest of your life. Because see, like once they put you on these meds, they don't take you off. I never hear doctors saying, where are we going to start you, then we're going to wean you off slowly. No, it's like, teach you on this, please take your med every day. Then you're taking it for the rest of your life. Then that's going to mess up with another kind of med that they're going to try to put you on for the rest of your life. My goal is to never be on any medications. I just turned 60. I ain't on no medications, and I plan on being dead with no medications. I ain't going to die from breast cancer. I'm hopefully die of old age in my sleep. I don't know. That's my goal. That, but it won't be from any of those things that my parents had dealt with. It won't be any of those disparities in my family. We got everything in our family. Cancer, diabetes, high blood pressure, heart disease. 
we got it all. But I've come from a large family. My mother had 19 in hers. Father came from a small family. But out of those 19, there was a mix of everything. Everything. A lot of it was lifestyle. I had a lot of alcoholics in my family. Amen? We have a lot of alcoholics in our family. So alcohol is a big, big risk factor for almost every um, disease that we're dealing with. And I've, I've, I've learned over the 11 years, with breast cancer, they started off, oh, women can have two or three drinks a week. Then a couple of years ago, oh, just one or two. I heard it on the uh, GMA the other day. Oh, they're talking about one a week. I don't know. And I'm like, okay, just say stop drinking. I mean, it's going to that. Just, just keep it real. Just tell people they need to put the bottle down. That's hard. I struggle with that. That's hard. That's my 20%. That's my, I like a margarita every once in a while. And, and God's okay with that. I'm working on it. I, I, I'm a work in progress. Uh, but we all just, you know, we all are work in progress. So I just want you to be just diligent about your health. Get to know your family history. Other things, ladies, know your bodies. Didn't know your bodies. So when something alien comes there, you, it don't have to be a, uh, it don't even have to be a lump, ladies. It could be a, a inflammation. It could be a, a discharge. It could be a, a ping in your breast. So I like want. First of all, the myth is it has to be a lump. It's all other kind of signs. So get to know those other signs. But first, get to know your body so when that something happens, you can be like, hold up, that wasn't there. I don't have that. I don't remember all that happening. You know what I'm saying? Don't brush it off. If you feel something, do something. You know, especially if it's a consistent little nagging something. Some little change that ain't supposed to be there. Get to know your bodies. So when that alien comes in, you'll be like, no, sir, that will get behind me. That's not going to stay. I'm going to do something about it. I'm going to get this checked out. And we'll catch it early, whatever it is. Early detection truly does save lives. So we want to be diligent about our health. Put your health as a priority. Health is wealth. People work on businesses, and you can't do nothing if you can't crawl out the bed in the morning. If you're going to be, if you're going to be aching just to roll over. You want to be healthy, but you want to be well. And you want to have a good quality of life as you age. So at 60, I'm like, I'm you, I want to die in my sleep. It won't be a breast cancer. It won't be a, none of that stuff my parents and stuff deal with. My mother... Um, I had two parents. I had an active father, athletic, and then I had a, a mama that she, she did well talking, but she didn't give enough care about her health in terms of walking and exercising. So I, have, I grew up with both extremes, um, and luckily the two together, again, what I know now is the healthier, the healthier uh, parent, the one that was really diligent over the years, went out in a better light. He, he wasn't in pain. He had dementia, but my father was pushing it around all the way to the end. He didn't know where he was going at the end, but he was on that stroller. Dad, where you going? I'm. But he was moving, y'all. He was moving. I don't care. I can be out of my mind, but I'm going to be moving. I'm going to be moving. So all I have to say is just take care of yourself. If you want to have any information, we're definitely going to do some partnerships. Because my goal is to open up a holistic house of healing, a one-stop shop for breast cancer survivors, but also a place where cancer survivors could come and work out, continue to get information about prevention, continue to learn about healthy living tools and techniques um, from, from uh, learning new recipes and nutrition tips to working out and having a gym in, on site. So just so you can come around other people who have the same health goals. That's my goal. So we can work on that, bring that to fruition. I've been putting it out there. The Lord's going to make it happen. Amen. Lord's going to make it happen. And I thank you for having me. Tisa, before you go. Oh, yes, yes. Can you entertain just maybe if we have oh, a couple absolutely. of questions? Oh, absolutely. Any questions? Any questions? I don't know if I can answer, but... You know what? That is a great question. She said, does young people still get breast cancer? Um, we do, as black people. And actually, we're getting up early. So breast cancer is related to hormones, so that's why it's a late statin um, illness. Most people get breast cancer between 45 and 55 during those perimental times when our bodies are changing, hormones are changing in your breast. That's why it's usually a late stage. But we always lead it in the bad. But well, we have uh, getting, women getting diagnosed in their late 20s and 30s. And so that's why I say get to know your own body because they move the needle in terms of getting your mammogram, right? One year they say 40. Last, last year they said 50. They'll move it back to 40. I don't know what, what's making them move it, but all I know is check yourself. You can check yourself any time, any age, anywhere. You know what I'm saying? I want people to be diligent about knowing, getting to know your body because the medical profession, they ain't basing nothing on us, y'all. They're basing everything on Caucasian women. We, I need to encourage people to do more trials. We, we don't like trials. We don't even like going to the doctor. So 
Um, we just got to pray on being better and having more faith about they're not trying to kill us. We just, we just got to get over the Tuskegee stuff. We got to get over all of that history we have um, because we're dying anyway. So we might as well help them find out information that's going to help us live. So if you can be a part of a trial, if you can be a part of a test, think about it. I know people are like, I am not, no, I ain't being no guinea pig, but I understand. But we need to start moving past the fear. Faith over fear. That's what we're about, faith over fear. Yes, ma'am. I, yeah, I had a question. It's two questions. First, can you speak to sometimes the stigma, stigma that some of us as black people have going to the doctor? We want to have a black doctor. We don't have a lot of black doctors here oh, in our absolutely. area. And then, the other, and, and then the other one was you were saying something. I didn't know this. Um, breast cancer is not just a lump. There's other symptoms, too. I didn't know absolutely. that. Can you elaborate on that? Yes, ma'am. And so I wish I would have brought that thing. But there, there's probably other four or five or six other breast cancer symptoms. One is a, 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 a constant nag, like a ping, um, in the same spot. So we all get tender breasts around that time of the month. But if it's a consistent pain, not a not like, oh, they're sore. You know, we don't know what sore is. But if it's like a pain and it's in the same spot, get that checked out. If you have discharge, that you don't normally have discharge after nipple, get that checked out. That's not normal. If you have uh, an inflammatory breast, which means, you know, it's feeling swollen, it's hard, nipply, a bubbly, um, kind of red, kind of red. And this might be a little bit too graphic. Terrence, I don't know. Get it checked out. But there's some other things. Um, just there's about four or five other of the symptoms, absolutely, besides a, a lump. Yeah, it, get educated on that because it, it, sh it can show up in uh, something you're just looking for a lump and it's, it's that. Yes. Um, the stigma about going to the doctor, we all got to do better with that, y'all. We all got to do better with going to the doctor. Um, you gotta get. You, you don't know until you get it checked out. I, I have a friend who used to say, oh, "I'm good. I'm, I'm feeling good. I don't know. Everything's good." And I'm like, "No news is not good news if you don't even go get the news. You gotta go get the news, <laughs> right? Get your yearly checkups. Um, you should be getting at least yearly mammograms at 40, but you can check your breasts anytime. But at least, but we still gotta get Pap spears. You still gotta really just check. We're we're complicated. Women are complicated, you know, beings. That's we're wonderfully made because we have to have these babies and we have to grow up. The, but we also need to get everything checked. All those complications, things can happen. Things can grow. You know, the, our situations can ch change some things in our body. So just be more diligent about yearly. It's a yearly checkup. It's a, year, it's a yearly mammogram. I don't hear, hear nobody tell me mammograms hurt. It don't hurt worse than cancer. And I'm attest to that. I did radiation, I did chemo, I lost my hair, so I did the whole nine yards. So the Lord took me through it, but he said, I'm going to take you through it and I'm going to bring you through it so you can testify to it. Amen. That's why I'm here. That's why I'm here. So, You know what? Us. I'm glad you said make sure you get your physical. Absolutely. <clears throat> my sister was diagnosed with breast cancer um, six years ago. So last year she just was her first, you know, five-year and submission or remission. Five years is a big deal. Yes. Um, for five years. I will encourage women because still not all facilities do 3D. Mm -hmm. So know if your breasts are dense or not Absolutely. because that makes a difference. Yes. Um, when my sister was diagnosed, mm -hmm. she didn't have the lump. She didn't know pain. She had nothing. Okay. She just went in for her regular checkup. Found on the mammogram. Mm -hmm. Remember, mm -hmm. and it was found on a, and um, it. I, I can't remember what her name was for the cancer she had, but I remember it was a level zero. But it was the most aggressive form of breast cancer. So had she not been diligent about her physical, she may not be here today. My sister went through almost six months of radiation. And she, you know, she lives in the Chicago area. And I would tell you, she's my only sister. I'm the oldest and then it's my sister. 
I spoke to her every day, especially when she was on the days of her radiation. I am sure I spoke to her because some of the nurses that she had, they act like they didn't care. And the way my sister described, my sister knows I'm very claustrophobic and she would say, Evelyn, you, you can't go through this because you can't do this radiation. Oh, and I tell you, there were many times I was ready to go there and just slap a nurse around because of how she treated my sister. Well, the next year, I came around for my physical, and something was spotted on my 3D. That was the second time I had a 3D exam. And I thank God for the doctor that I had because she was aggressive. She knew my sister had been diagnosed. So I went from a mammogram to, I don't know if it was a CAT scan. No, it was a ultrasound. And then we're gonna have to send you to the hospital because now you need an ear bar eye. Now, all this time I'm not understanding What's going on? Why am I going through it? But I just thought it was normal. And then when they said, well, you now need an MRI, I was like, hold up. I got to call my husband. You know, they, had, they didn't tell me that they had, you know, because the person that looks at your image, it's not their job to tell you what they find. So they told the doctor, and the doctor was on it like that. I, I ended up in probably three days in surgery. And thank God, it was just fatty tissue. But the surgeon, when I met him, he said to me, if I see what they say is there, I'm just going to remove it and we'll biopsy it later because of what's going on in your family. So I'm glad he did that because normally it's, you don't go through all of that. You know, it's a biopsy, wait for the results and things like that. But no, I had, I, it was removed. And, and so they told me because your breasts are dense, we still want you to keep up, you know, cause I'm 67. They're like, we still want you to keep up with your mammogram. Cause I'm at the age where I don't have to go every year. But my doctor, she doesn't fight me on that. See you in two years. Cause she know I'm gonna see you next year. When I leave out of here, I'm going to make my appointment for next year. I, I, I can't play with it. My mom had breast cancer and my mother never had a mammogram. We didn't know my mom had breast cancer until we were told her breast cancer had metastasized to brain cancer. She had had breast cancer for a year. And I asked her, I said, you never, you know, because she was always telling me, make sure you, when I turned 35, that was when you got your mammogram back in the day. It was 35, it wasn't 40. And so I can't encourage women enough. You don't listen to your doctor. You be the advocate for your own medical care because when they say, I'll see you in two years, you go, I'll see you next year. Because two years can make a huge difference, you know. So I, th I yes, ma'am, and I, I, I'm just grateful that you have started this program. I'm grateful that you have been a survivor because I know it's no fun going through breast cancer. So I thank you. Thank you so much, Tisa, for just coming and sharing. Yep, anytime. You'll be seeing more of it. We are doing. Our we are definitely doing a collaboration. We'll be, and we want to bring it monthly because the more we can feed you, the more you can incorporate it into your life. The more you hear it, the more you can start doing it. Give this beautiful young lady a round of applause. Thank Thanking you. her for your time. All righty, our next speaker. I think I talked with you uh, last Sabbath. And I shared with you, he's with the Charles Drew Health Center. He is, um, his name is Saw O. 
He uh, does outreach into the community, talks about Medicaid, Medicare, all of their services. And I shared with you, this is, uh, means a lot to me. Each one of these you'll find. I'll have a personal story for everybody that's going to come and talk to you. Because I had the pleasure, Tisa, thank you. I had the pleasure of working at Charles Drew Health Center for 25 years. And I started my journey at Charles Drew Health Center uh, with our own senior elder, Robert Patterson. And I shared with you that Robert Patterson uh, and a group of other men started Charles Drew Health Center. And uh, I think that's so important. I was sharing with him today, that's a part of his legacy to this community, that there wasn't a health center in this community serving people of color in this community. And it was 40 some years ago. It was just an idea of a master's level social worker who said, I'm going to make a difference. And he very quietly went about creating the organization that now sits at 2915 Grant Street. So when you drive by and you see Charles Drew Health Center, you know that the Seventh Day Adventist message and our strength and our leadership in this community is real and it is alive. So I'd like to give saw the opportunity to share just a little bit about Charles Drew, the work that he does, and then share with us some things about some good changes that are happening in Medicaid. Welcome, Saul. Hi, uh, my name is Saul Sumeo. I am a community engagement from Charles Drew Health Center. Um, since my Asian name is difficult to pronounce, people call me O or Mr. O. Um, um, to be honest, uh, um, to be making a presentation among elderly and elders of the community, it is really making me nervous, but I'm going to try my best and bring in the uh, good information. Um, Charles, you, we are neighbor. We located on Grand Street and we open a new clinic on 4th Street down, down north, right across from Metro. And then we have a new opening clinic in Old Benson area on 4th Street, uh, Maple. And we are now planning to open the newest location on Ames, right behind Walmart. Walmart, yes. Uh, we are expanding and we do have school-based health center across North Omaha inside OPS school. Uh, APS group, and we offer medical, behavior, dental. We do um, chronic disease maintenance, uh, prostate can cancer check, uh, annual well woman check, pet smear, and then we do have a mammogram, mammogram program. Um, it is every month or sometime, once every two or three months, you can give us a call or stop in for that program and it is at no cost program. It is no cost program, it, it is really great. And we also do have um, Omaha Healthy Star, Omaha Healthy Star week and then SNAP. Uh, for Omaha Healthy Star, if someone is expecting a baby during pregnancy or after pregnancy, they can take that benefits. Um, they offer uh, important health information, one-on-one -on -one support, life family and life planning, uh, maternal health service, fatherhood services, incentives and educational classes. And then we do have um, pharmacy, pharmacy program. It is located inside the main location in Grand Street. Our pharmacy is uh, participated in federal uh, 340B program, which allows patients to stay up to 90%. 90% of retail price for their medication. So medication could be really expensive. It is really a great program, but um, you have to be, just one thing, you have to be a patient of Charles Drew. But we still would like to encourage you to uh, take our pharmacy um, benefit for that. And we also offer free STD, STI treatment and testing. Patient can walk in for that at any of our location of location and COVID we are giving our COVID vaccine but in the meantime uh, we are still waiting for another vaccine to arrive so um, we just put patient on wait list if they come in or give us a call to schedule their COVID appointment for booster shot um, and sliding fee scheme 
if patient doesn't have insurance, Medicaid, we see them based on their income. Um, the minimum is $35 to maximum is $80. And it is done for a visit. It is also a really great program. And we, uh, health insurance, health insurance is really important. Uh, we encourage you to always look out for a letter or mail from State Department about health insurance renewal fund. Um, but if you need help applying or need renewal, we can assist you with this. We have a team of um, eligibility and enrollment teams that can help you with applying Medicaid. And if your income limits it way over Medicaid, uh, we can help you look fine for affordable health insurance through Marketplace. So that's also a really great. And Medicaid, as of 2023, they are doing Medicaid expansion, also known as Health Retage Health Insurance. For adult, the income limit is 1600 and that is gross, gross income limit. And if a person with a newborn kid up to age one, that income limits go up to about $2,000, $2,000. And a family of two with newborn babies up to age of one, the income limits is about $2,600. So the formula is to add 600 for every extra family member based off that uh, $1,600. And then you can calculate your uh, if you are eligible for Medicaid or not. So we have Medicaid, we have health insurance through marketplace, but sometimes people disqualify for Medicaid because their income limit is just over a couple hundred dollars. Uh, in that case, they have a program called Medically Share of Cost, also known as Spend Down, Spend Down Program. A patient can be qualified for Medicaid through the spend down program. Uh, for example, if your income is just over $50 for the Medicaid income maximum limit, that $50, we can help you apply for insurance through Marketplace, uh, reduce down the cost of your income limit. That way you can qualify for Medicaid benefits. And then for that spend, spend down cost, the maximum limit can up to $392 for a family, and also the same amount for two uh, family members, and then it could be up to 400 to over 1,000 for um, a family or seven to eight. So that's also really good to know because I never knew before we help apply for patient to get Medicaid, but then they came back and they said, um, they didn't approve me for Medicaid because my income limit is just over $50, $100, but to apply for insurance, it is still really um, expensive for me. But now in that case, uh, we know what to do. We can help you look for um, affordable health insurance. Uh, spend down those dollar amount, maybe fifty or sixty dollar, and then help you apply, reapply again to get uh, Medicaid. Medicaid. So that's really good. Um, that's all I have uh, for Charles U Health Center. I hope my informations are really um, helping the community, and I just feel blessed. As, uh, my personal testimony: I came from Burma. Uh, we never have this kind of community gathering where um, churches, community organizations, individuals come together and help out uh, people in need, help back to community. It is really great. And to say, uh, hey, bless you, to go to work and then when you see someone, bless you, this is not happening in my country. So I just really feel blessed um, to, to move to America to be here today, and, and thank, thank you for having me. Thank you. Do we have any questions? We have a question here. Yes.
you mentioned uh, the, the different Charles Drew uh, facilities. You know, one on, on Grant Street, is that still open? Yes. Okay. And then there's one also I saw on 30th and 4th Street uh, by Old Metro. But the, the facilities that are open, do they do different, are they like for different things? Or, or is, okay, for instance, the uh, Charles Drew on uh, 30th and 4th Street, is that just for dental only, or is that a full service? Did, what I'm trying to say is, is each of the facilities full service, or do they uh, you know, specialize, right, Sorry. in different uh, uh, areas of medicine? Oh, yes, for the 4th Street Clinic, they offer dental and behavior and medical three services. But currently, they only have a pediatric at the 4th Street Clinic. Uh, but for the Grand Street is everything, and also including uh, pharmacy and Omaha Healthy Star and WIP program. WIP program, yes. Oh, on Grand Street, yes. Uh, dental, medical, and behavior. Behavior, yes. Oh, yes. Uh, want to make an appointment how do you know do you just call the Charles Drew uh, line and just ask them and they'll tell you which facility yes. would they uh, that you would you know be uh, eligible for or yeah okay yes we, we thank, will thank uh, confirm yes it is um, um, it is causing patient confusing where do they have to go so we are telling our uh, main line um, employee that please confirm where they have to go for their apartments. Yes, thank you. Yes. Mr. O, oh, is that Mr. O? Yes. Sir. Okay, Mr. O, I just want to affirm you for even coming. Okay. Um, often we are coming to your neighborhood and sharing with you guys. I've had an opportunity to work with Burmese, Myanmar, yeah. oh. okay? I get it on so many different levels. And I just want to thank you um, for being here, for being a part of our community. And the demographics in our community has totally changed. I grew up around the 24th and Pratt Street area. Now everybody is represented. And when we think about that, isn't that what heaven is going to be like? We have to be willing to learn and glean. That's what our Sabbath school lesson has been talking about, mission, right? Learning and talking and gleaning from people that like us they don't come from where we come from but what comes from the heart reaches the heart and again I just want to affirm you for facing your fear and you're nervous I don't see it just mm. talk with you baby and you know what <laughs> you're doing so thank you Mr. O yeah. glad thank you, you. Were, glad you <laughs> came thank you for the love. Oh, hold up Sister Green I'll bring the microphone to you I'd like to know more about the spin down program. Is that new? So if you over like $25, you don't qualify, so you go to the spin down uh, program? Yes, I also didn't know NC until last month. Oh. It, it is new, but it is a complex process where you have to um, re-enroll re for the oh, okay. Medicaid that they deny you, and then you have to go to um, health insurance marketplace and request a letter for that. Uh, but we can assist you with this. Um, please make an uh, appointment or please come stop by and then we have uh, two ladies that can assist you with it. They, they are really expert in that area. Okay. Okay. Yes. Thank you. Thank you. Yes. Thank you. Lessons to you. Let's give him another round of applause. He did a wonderful job. Thank you for all of the materials that you brought to us as well. We appreciate it. Um, our, our final presentation will come to you from U-Turn. Uh, these are my guys. God get, blesses you uh, over your, you know, and he just blesses you. And, and there's times that, you know, there's just people, I'm not a person, I don't believe in, you know, you don't be going to work to make friends, you be going to work to do your job. You don't be coming trying to be my friend. Well, these two gentlemen have become my brothers. Um, and they just have a compelling uh, story, testimony. 
they understand gang violence. I really wanted them to come and talk and you go, why gang? Okay, we got breast cancer, we got Charles Drew. Now, what in the world is gang violence? Because it is a health condition. It is a health condition. Um, um, I'm not even gonna, listen, this is my former employer only about five months ago, so I'm not getting ready to tell the story. I'm gonna let them tell it. These, I, I, and gentlemen, when I talked about you last week, I called you young men. I said, when these young men come to talk to you, listen, I'm gonna invite uh, George Devers, who is the manager of the school program, and I'm gonna invite my brother, Ron, uh, Ron, you see I'm old now, Ron Smith, who runs our street program. You guys just sit back, they have a wonderful testimony for you, and then we will uh, entertain some questions. My brothers. Thank you, thank you. Thank you, thank you, Mrs. Judith, thank you. I wanna, I wanna first off just uh, thank uh, Sharon Seventh Day uh, Adventist Church uh, for having us, Pastor Waters, Ms. Judith, my, my mentor. I could, I could truly say that. I don't say that about a lot of people. A true mentor, a true pillar. Learned a lot, learned a lot. Uh, definitely a blessing. <clears throat> Today, we, we just gonna give an overview, uh, give a little testimony, um, share my ups and downs, and just give uh, the audience a clear understanding of the work that we do in the community. Um, U-turn is a, a replication of the cure of violence model that's out of Chicago, Illinois. And um, under that model, we, we focus on three components. Detect and interrupt violence, behavior change, and changing community norms. Uh, under the umbrella of U-Turn, we have a school outreach, which I'm the manager of. We have a street outreach, and we have a women's violence prevention program. Uh, most of our staff is licensed mediators uh, through the Office of Concord Mediation uh, from the Office of uh, Dispute Resolution. Uh, we do a lot of mediations. Uh, my primary purpose going into schools and, and collaborating with the schools is to offer intervention, prevention, uh, mediation, uh, educational services. We utilize the Phoenix curriculum in the schools. But most importantly is to go into schools and engage the young people. We work with the highest risk. Highest risk meaning, can, can I be honest with you? Highest risk meaning, if he or she don't turn their life around, they headed those two places. We have enough community uh, partners in the community that just work with the bad kid. He just talking back, she just talking back, they skipping school. So we do warm handoffs to our community partners, but we wanna focus on the highest risk. Those individuals that we know they're known gun carriers. We know they got a family history of violence. We know they just got out of prison, uh, uh, the youth center, the penitentiary on, on underlying violence offenses. We know we need to get in their ear, tap them on the shoulder and stay consistent with, with seeing them, knock on that front door, that side window, that back door. <clears throat> so we go into schools with the help of, of the school administrators. We go in and engage build relationships, build that trust, and get them to really buy into how working with one of our case managers really would benefit them. We understand change don't happen overnight. Change don't happen overnight. So <clears throat> with, with working one our, with one of our case managers, it might, we might be working with an individual for two years. It's gonna be a lot of falling forward, get up, Dust yourself off, we're gonna keep moving forward. You know, um, and, and one thing about the work, a lot of young people mindset is, how can you correct me if you ain't correct yourself? So with doing this work, you got to really model what change look like. You got to really model what change look like. Because any little thing they can use, I, 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 I saw you coming out the, or I saw you hitting this, or I saw you turning up. You know, so working with individuals for a period of time and really peeling back those layers to get to the core of what's going on in this individual's life. We gotta fill a lot of gaps. You got too much time in your day. We got to work on 
employability skills, how you can obtain, retain a job. We got to, we got to work on, it's easy for you to go out there in the community and tell your homies, your, your, your homegirls, I love you, but you, it's hard for you to tell your mom, your grandma, and your daddy you love them. We got to work on that. We are gonna work on how a healthy relationship look like. You know, so that takes time. You know, that take a lot of accountability. That takes, what I'm saying, filling them gaps. Cause to be honest, every kid that we, that, that, that we work with don't come from just a single parent house. They, they come from loving families. But the influence out there is real. The social medias, the peer pressure, the, the rap music, the rap music with a, a lack of manhood in rap music right now. They ain't telling you to, to, to run to the church. They ain't telling you to uh, run to your job and, and, and be productive. They, they telling you to go run, get high on this, handle conflict this way, uh, 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 females this and that, and come on. So young people got to be reconditioned. How they speak, how they understand, and how they think is off. You got to recondition their brain. It's off. So, and, and my, my colleague Ron had, uh, speak on the, the, street, the street approach, but our approach in the schools is to, to reach those individuals, build those relationships, do a period of time to walk them to the A to B, you know, to be a productive citizen, and, and, and we understand because we've been through it. You know, I, I like to say my job is to eliminate the excuses young people use. I, I grew up in the projects, Vietnam projects. I was around when gang first started on my hall. You can't tell me about nothing about no gang. Can't nobody come in here and tell me nothing about gangs in Omaha. I was there when the first gang shootings happened. I was involved in the gang shootings that, that happened in Omaha in the 90s, 80s and 90s. My mom was on drugs. My dad died when I was young. No, I, I embraced the destruction that was happening in the 80s and 90s. Went to prison 13 years of my life. It took for me to go to prison to really pump my brakes and, 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 and really evaluate my life. To really evaluate my life. And I know ultimately it was going to take for me to make a change and model what change looked like. I had to shake some, some old friends. You know, I started, I don't know, how, I don't know how many people know uh, David Rice, you know what I'm saying, <laughs> Mondo, sharp brother. I started reading books, knowing about my culture, walking in a different light, them brothers hold me accountable. Started doing this type of work inside of prison. Uh, got, out of, got out of prison. And, and ultimately, when I say you have to walk it a different way, I, I, I was, I was in, in jail for a murder and, and, drug, and a drug charge. So I had to show the parole board that I wasn't no longer a threat to society. I had to walk it, I really had to walk it like I talk it. And I'll share this a lot, but when I went to the parole board, and, and the victim, my victim's family show up through the years of me going to the pro bar again denied, you know, of course, a, a mom gonna show emotion because, you know, I took her son's life. But, but her knowing, you know, he's not getting in trouble in here, you know, and seeing me through the years, my last uh, parole hearing, she stood up, gave me a hug, was like, this ain't the same young man. This ain't the same young man. And I, I, bro I broke down like a baby. I broke down crying. I ain't even gonna lie. I broke down crying, but ultimately I knew, you know, I gotta do right when I get out. It'll be a slap in the face to her. It'll be a slap in the face to my family that gave me support while I was in there. And ultimately, you know, it'd be an ultimate slap in the face to, to myself. You know, uh, one thing about prison, it'll bring the best out of you or ruin you for life. So, being out of prison, I completed 10 years on parole. Not 10 months, 10 years. 10 years on parole. Uh, 
was still doing his work part-time. Not part-time, I started out just volunteering. Um, I had a full-time job. You know, I had a, and I, I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the challenges, but one of my challenges was self-sufficiency. I had a fear of going to get, going to, I had a fear of going to get my own spot. I had parole to my sister house. I was cramping her style because she had a, a boyfriend. I'm walking around with my, my with, with a tank top on, and he ain't coming over no more. She got a, she got an attitude. She got an attitude, so you know I could see the attitude all in her face. You know, so you know, uh, got in a relationship that I wasn't ready for. So I was tired of. You getting out, you getting out, you getting out. So I jumped out on faith. You know, one thing I always had was a good work ethic. I always kept a job. I always had a job. From the time I paroled to right now, I always had a job. Um, had a good work ethic. So I jumped out on faith, got my own spot. Um, the reason why I say that because <clears throat> a lot of young men and grown men, for this matter, and women have a fear of going to get their own spot, to get self-sufficiency. But it really taught me to pay bills on time. I'm not a person that well, I don't want to miss nothing. So it, it, it really kind of educated me because I didn't learn it in school as far as the credit, how it helped my credit, going to get this card and paying it off. And it, it aligned me with having good credit. But, but ultimately, having that, that having that sense of accomplishment and, and discipline to go get my own spot. Until I met my queen, and that's another story. You know, that's another story, and we live together now. And he say he's not a preacher. But, but ultimately, this on the, on the school, the school side of, of U-Turn, uh, we just want to build those relationships in the community. Uh, we understand change don't happen overnight. It takes consistency. It takes you being visible in the community. Uh, I know, you know, y'all saw some yard signs somewhere. Y'all saw somewhere with the orange and the purple on. I hope y'all saw it somewhere. Uh, be, being visible in the community. Uh, we also have a U-turn basketball team down at the Hope Center for kids. You know, I meet people. I meet young people where, where they at. You know, and I use basketball as a tool to build relationships. Even though we play on one day out the week, but I want to help you, you know what I'm saying, you know what I'm saying, in life. You know, uh, <clears throat> um, what else? Uh, the church, how, how can the church be involved? Um, I, I, think, I think, and can I be honest, you know, the church, the church got to get, get back to uh, having no open arms, you know, because a lot of young people think, well, they're judging us, you know, uh, we got to get back to come as you is, but don't leave as you was. You know, uh, but a lot of young people need something because it, it's it's a it's a tug of war because you got to give young people something to build off of. When they when they wake wake up to nothing, you know, uh, you know. For example, if the church if the church you know adopted a young man or a woman for the summer. Give them, some, give them some projects to look forward to waking up to, opposed to waking up and just grabbing the phone with nothing, nothing planned out for the day. You know, so we got to get come back, come back to that that approach. You know, uh, meeting people where they at. You know, uh, you know that's just part of part of the story. You know, uh, what, what, good, hey, what he said. Everything he said. Now, they, um, 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 you turn, you turn. When I think about you turn, I think about our mission statement. I don't know if y'all know about what what you turn offer. You turn offers support and resources to break the cycle of poverty, to reduce violence, trauma, to promote positive behavior change, create resiliency. Safer communities, healthy families, and safer communities. That's, that's, our, that's our mission thing. I wake up in the morning thinking about who I'm going to help, support, and give resources to so that they may bring forth a change. 
We say 180, we say you turn, we say make a 180 against violence. That means turn from this way to go this way and keep going. See, a credible messenger is who we are. We just didn't make the, the, the U-turn, we just didn't make the 180 from violence, but we kept going. George kept going after 10 years of being out, kept going, kept reaching. That what makes us credible. So when we come into the community and I pull up on a young cat just like I did just two hours ago, come here. He know who I am. And he see me in a blue truck. He know me, because I, I wear a couple of hats, I'm going to get to that. He know me as Chaplain Pastor Ron Smith because he was in the youth center for a year and a half and I did Bible study with him and then when he got out I helped him get a job I went to his house and talked to his mom and now he's 23 years old trying to make it on his own see, see, see George said something that, that sparks me you know uh, uh, how could the church help One of the, I'm, I'm, I'm going to keep it 100 one thing I don't do I don't, I don't talk off the cuff I'll tell, tell you about me when you see me you, you're going to know it because I'm going to let you know it I was scared to come here to Seventh Day Adventist Church. Yeah, and I mean, Miss Judith, cool. This is my big sister. This is my mentor. Me and her, we pray together, talk to oh, Don't even start. You already left. No, no, you know, you know, you know, you're right. She came here with you as a guest. Watch this. But, but what I'm saying, what I'm saying, she's better than you, sister. That's my girl. She, she know, she know tap. But let me tell you what I was scared of. I, I'm like, where my hat? I didn't want nobody to tell me to take off my hat. And I was ready if y'all did. <laughs> I'll take off my hat. Notice I still got a cap on. Why? Because I got a skin condition. I got lupus in my head. Hits my head and my ear. I got a rare form of lupus. I don't like to talk about it all the time. It's a challenge for me. So, so when you see me in my hat and I go to most churches, and, and I know the rule, Take off your hat. You more worried about my hat than my health. So when young people come, I'm 60 years old and I was scared. Cause you imagine me being 16 with my pants hanging down? Oh, y'all gonna mess them up. Pull your pants up, boy. That's how we wear them. That's the style. Remember when they had a style back in your day in the 60s, like the bell bottom jeans? I, I, I don't I don't wear my pants without a crease. I be creased up every time. They said, man, you put stuff. Yeah, because that's the style. But going back to doing this stuff in the community, I, I started off, I started off doing this on the corner. God sent me to Omaha, Nebraska. I didn't know, I didn't even know what black folks in Omaha. I went from Chicago, High Ride Projects, Robert Taylor Southside. And through a housing opportunity, right after I just got out of jail for my third armed robbery, got found not guilty by a jury. Boy, that was great. The hand of God was on my life. Got me out, got married. Been married 28 years. Hallelujah. My own woman, not nobody else's. So, so through a housing opportunity, we landed a three bedroom townhome. Where we come from, townhome. And the rent was $25 a month. It was in Sioux City, Iowa. I told my mama I had to move because God told me to move to Sioux City. You know what she told me? She said, we don't have no kin folks in Sioux City. Why would God tell you to go? Mama, God wasn't talking to you. He was talking to me. Stayed up in Sioux City for six and a half years learning how to to understand life because I, I grew up in a broken home, no dad Step, two step daddies, one would beat me half to death, the other one wouldn't even talk to me so here it is, I got a wife and four kids and I'm in a all white neighborhood and know they judge me, but God gave me something here's what he gave me, he said I want you to learn how to do what they do so I mean, be quiet, and every time you go to church, you learn something. So I started watching them white folks. 
They always save their money. I start saving some of mine. They gave the kids a time out. I didn't agree with all that, but. Because uh, God said, spoil the rock, sp spare the rock, spoil the child. The belt didn't leave my house, so. But God sent me down to Sioux City, sent me down to Omaha and told me to stand on the corner of 30 of the names and preach the gospel. I've been called to ministry since I, I accepted Christ in 1993 in Cook County Jail. So when I got on the corner, I ain't, I ain't never been scared of nobody. I ain't never been scared to talk. Talking is not a problem with me. I'm going to say something. Even when I ain't got nothing to say, I'm going to say something. I'm going to find something to say. And somebody saw me on the street preaching and said, would I go talk to the kids? And they said, go in the youth center. And took me in the youth center in 2005, November. They, that, that's when they had their first suicide, successful suicide in November. And Chapel Ryan showed up on the spot. So I'm in the youth center from 2006 to 2011, but I, 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 I learned something dealing with the youth going in and out of the youth center. Because y'all know they go in and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. And I said, well, I need to go to the street. So when I get out, I can go to the families and help the kids. When they get out, they can get a job. I was a McDonald's manager for 15 years. So when they get out, I give them a job at McDonald's. Most of them those that would come. I did that for about six and a half years. Then I went out on my own. Come trying to save this city. I'm trying to save these young folks. I drove the cab for about two years, 2015 and 2017. 2017, I met Miss Judah with U-Turn. And I think God created U-Turn just for me. He said, my boy needs some money. I'm going to have to create something. I'm going to get him a real check. From 2017 until now, to this day, I talk to young people everywhere in this city. I go to their houses. I talk to high-risk individuals every day. I don't talk to the at-risk. I know they're around. But I'm talking to the ones with the pistol in their pants. And their mama said, not mine. Not my child. My child. You don't even know your baby, do you? Your baby the main shooter. Your grandbaby is the one that gave him the bullets. Yeah, they have that. Yeah, y'all, no, my, my fault. Don't look at me. Y'all grandbaby, y'all nieces and nephews, y'all know who they is. Y'all know who they is. Don't look at me like I'm saying something wrong. They out there. They, they making headlines in the news. I know two of them got out already. One got out last week and another one got out yesterday. Known shooters. So when you talk about gang violence in Omaha, yes, it's not number about 80 of them. But look, I'm all too small to have 80 real live shooters out at one time and don't nobody talk to them. And they say, you turn, you know, we be out there, we be gathering information, I'll be the main one. So I want to keep it real. They, you know, we don't work with the police. We do not work. I don't work with the police. I don't do nothing with the police. George don't do nothing with We We, we, we do that for a reason. But our organization do collaborate with law enforcement. I tell young people every day, you shoot at the blue truck, the big blue truck, you going to jail. <laughs> Your Honor, it was him. I'm a citizen. I'm not a gang member. And what that means, I'm not a snitch if you shoot at my stuff. And they, the gang members, they laugh at me. I say, I'm not playing. You beat chap up, you're going to jail. I'm coming to court every time you go. I'm showing up. And we keep it real with them. And they know it's authentic. So when you get one of these young cats like, like the one that got out of prison yesterday, and he didn't know, and I'm just going to give you a couple of stories, he didn't know that I'm connected to his baby mama. Uh, his baby mama, mama, went to church with me. So when I found out that he had a baby by her daughter, I called her and talked to her. And me and her, and we didn't already talked to her. They don't know that. Now, he hadn't called me yet, and he got out yesterday. He didn't know I was watching when he went in, and I'm watching when he get out, me and Miss Judah had a conversation about our Bellevue boy. See, she know who I'm talking about. So, so now he out now. And now he ain't, see, he ain't saw me, ain't heard me or nothing, so guess what I do? I'm pulling up on him, but guess where he at? He way on the other side of Waterloo. Yeah, I'm going to drive that blue truck all the way to Waterloo. <laughs> on the other side of Waterloo. He, he don't know I know where he at. He a known pistol cat, no gang member, for real, for real. Make it happen. Then been shot at, then shot somebody, got a murder on his hand. I'm going past Waterloo to see him, to talk to him, get in his ear, and tell him one thing. Don't come back. 
I relocated. I probably couldn't do this work in Chicago. So you turn off of your way out, but you got to listen. Most of these cats that's 23 and 24, move somewhere else. That's my thing. Man, my turn. Move. You so tough, but you scared to move? You gangster, but you won't move. You got all this money, but you won't move. You want to stay right here in Omaha and hurt people, hurt your moms. So when we talk about the street factor, the street is a whole different thing. Uh, we got mediation conflict. Huh? Yeah, okay. Yeah. We got mediation conflict. Well, we had a gang member. Gang member A knew me and told me he was going to kill gang member B. I knew gang member B. I liked him a little more than gang member A, but I kind of liked the both of them. But So I went to gang member B and said, hey, man, let's talk because I don't want you to kill him. He, he, he said he's going to kill you. So I got them together, me, George, and about five of us, and we met at, 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 a, at, a, at a spot to mediate this conflict. And we was only meet with these guys. Both of them carry a pistol from gang. And we only meet so we tell each other, if I see you, I'm not going to shoot at you. Yeah, because I said, if you give me your word, I'm going to let the street know you gave me your words. So we got them together. So we take, we take their cell phones. They can't ride with us when we go to you know, because they be pinging off each other. Uh, they be sending their location to their buddies. So they got to leave their cell phone. We search them so they don't have a gun. And we meet at a location like, where did we meet? Walmart. We met at Walmart under the, 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 the video camera. Yeah, you know, at Walmart where they video the parking lot. That's where we met at. <laughs> and it's crazy. And they said they weren't going to shoot each other. And when it happened, they saw each other. They called me up. Call me up with the with one with the nine in his hand, had the gun in his left. Say, see your boy? Show me, show me my boy uh, on FaceTime. Say, see what I got? You lucky I thought about you, Chuck. I'm going to let him slide. Y'all won't hear about that. Y'all won't hear about that kind of that's what you. That's the, that's the work you turn to. I got a call Friday from a young lady to talk about W. We had a women's violence prevention. A woman's violence prevention special uh, 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 manager. She's out doing training with our assistant director. So I get a call from a woman said that, hey, you passed out a sign in my yard and, and I need some help. Well, what you need help with? Well, I'm on drugs and, and I need to get off drugs and I also need a place to say, I say, well, we don't really do that, but is there anything else going Because we got a woman's program and, and, you know, they deal with domestic problems and violence with domestic partners. And then I said, so you got a drug problem? And she said, yeah, the other one too, but I can't talk right now. What other one? She's being abused. And the dude that's abusing is standing right there, but she can't talk right now. I didn't even pick up on him. I had to go talk to my director. So I tell her, well, uh, 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 our women's director going to be back Monday. We're going to have a meeting with you. And she gave me a location. I said, I'm just going to pass this on to, the, to, the, to, to, to Ms. Tamiki. But the reality is she's getting abused right now, and she can't talk about it. I called it out. And she said, yeah, that other one, too. The, uh, I said, drugs, yeah, and the other one, but I can't talk right now. Matter of fact, she had me hold on. I don't know what the dude was doing. But I, that, that was Friday. They didn't put that on the news, but th that we do that kind of work. Y'all didn't know that? That we really out there in the trenches? That we really, we really about this work? And Miss Judith knows, so when she called us in, she knew what she was doing. She said, she, she, she giving you some info that you ain't going to hear about on the news. Because when we save lives, you won't hear about it. You hear about the ones that we, could, we talked to. Many of them we didn't talk to that got killed. Many of them we didn't talk to that went to jail. Many of them. But it's also many of them that walked away. No, you turn, you turn design to help these young folks do, mediate their conflict a different way. And I have been in situations where, you know, you know, I asked one guy, so what, what would it do to stop? You know, in your mind, you'd be like, why don't they just stop? So I asked the question, would it ever stop? They said, no. I said, why? They said, chap, for real? I said, yeah. What do you mean? Never gonna, project's going to always be against 29th Street. 40th Ave is going to always be against 29th Street. The bottoms is going to always be against Uptown and Hilltop. I'm, always? They said, yeah. I said, why? Bloodshed. Too many people done died for nothing. So now these knuckleheads don't know how to stop. But all the shooting in the world ain't going to bring back the little dude that got killed at the mall. When I did the funeral, I told them all. They was pallbearers. 
Retaliation, whatever you do, it's not going to bring them back. So why do it? It's not going to bring them back. You're going to do that to somebody else's mom. Last but not least, every person that work at Utah, and I got this from my mentor, and I, and I wear this. I wear this with honor. I wake up every day, and I owe. I owe. I took back. I'm an ex-game banker. I'm an ex-felon. I'm an ex-stick-up kid. I'm an ex-dope fiend. I, I, my name should have been Ronald X. I did everything. I owe. I got to get back. I wake up every day knowing that I get a paycheck on the back of kids dying. Yeah, they, they give me a check because violence is in our city. I wake, up, I wake up every morning thinking about it. Since you told me that about a year or two ago, we get paid up at U-Turn on the hills of dead folk, dead young people, dead young, the 19-year-old Swift girl, the 18, 16-year-old Swift boy. We got to go talk to their moms. Get a check because I'm involved with trying to stop the violence. If there is no violence, there's no need for me. So I, I carry my job real well, real well. I get up with that. I think about it when I go to sleep. Yeah, I think about it when I lay down. I got eight cameras around my house because I live in the hood. I live in the hood. I live in the hood. I don't live out west. George lives a little more west than me, but I live in the hood. When I go to the store, I'm seeing little homies. My wife don't go to the store in the hood. <laughs> she don't. It's real violent. But you can only make a difference if you're in it. So for me, the role of the church is to get in it. Get in the game. Don't get too comfortable just coming here every Saturday. Say, I know you're know, you praying, you praying, you praying. Oh, I forgot to tell y'all, I'm an ordained minister and, 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 and I'm, 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 I'm licensed to do everything. But you in here praying and then you go out there smiling. No. You be in here praying and you go out there praying. Kicking butt, giving resources, checking them. Don't be scared of them. Them young kids, they want to respect somebody. This woman here done talk to a whole lot of tough guys. When they come into a home, they come in tough. Who that is? They, they walk out with their pants pulled up, their hat straight, and they say, thank you, Miss Judith. They give me and George all the issues, but give Miss Judith. I like that. That's a nice lady. And Miss Judith tell him, I'm going to be calling and checking in on you too. She said, okay, I'm going to be doing real good too. So while you praying, yeah, pray, but then go get involved too. Say something to him. Don't let him off the hook. I holler at him. Say, come here, come here. And then they come, they don't even know me. They come. Okay. They laugh. That's 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 my message and I'm sticking to it. Do we have any questions? Okay, I'm gonna give Brother Patrick. George, you can come on back up and join us. You got it? Okay. <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you for what you all do. I have two sons and they both have been in gangs. My oldest son was telling me stories the other day. I said, Hallelujah, praise God for the covering. He should not be here. He walked and toted guns like up and down the highway with drugs. I didn't know none of this stuff until a week ago. And I said, sometimes mamas don't need to know everything. But I praise God for the work that you do. I want to be involved. Um, when I lived on Pinckney Street, the, the boys, you know, the 44th, 
Forty-four pre- the, four to four. I, I, I know the house. <laughs> four to four. I know the house. The blue house. Yeah, on the cone. There you go. <laughs> All right, so you know my boys. I know, I know the house. Yeah. Anyway, um, I remember one day there was a group of boys on the corner, and this was way after I had moved out, but my sons, of course, were still in the neighborhood. And I started talking to them. I'm like, what are you all going to do with the rest of your life? You know, and, and Mark was like, Mom, Mom. I'm like, shh, what y'all going to do with the rest of your life? Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus can make a difference in your life? I did give them all my phone number. I was texting them and sending them scriptures. And Mark said, Mommy, you really need to quit doing that. No, nobody went on this. I don't care about what you want. This is what the Lord told me to do. But then I stopped doing it. You know, I need to get back involved because there are children who need to know Jesus. And I want to help. I want to help physically and I want to help financially. So tell me what I need to do. First thing. Don't introduce them to Jesus. Let them see the Jesus in you. You ain't got to bring that conversation up. Call them over. You know, you, you know them because you're on 44th and Pinkney. You know, like, I know the house. Ain't but one house that gets shot up all the time. You, you know the house. No, 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 that wasn't my house. No, that no, 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 no. Oh, okay, but you yeah, know yeah. the house, though. Yes, 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 yeah. yes, yes. So what I'm saying, first thing, invite them to lunch. Mm. Invite them to lunch. Uh, uh, cook a meal. Get some snacks when you see them walk past. When you go to the school, I don't know if you go to the school, go to the school, go to the school, see what's happening in the community. We just had a, an, a, an event, a Halloween event. Google what's going on in Omaha mm -hmm. so you can know what's going on, where, where young people's meeting at. Mm -hmm. You know, Google it because they, they let us, uh, 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 what, Willie Barney and then what's the organization? Mm -hmm. Empowerment Network. They let you know what's going on in the community. Tap into those resources. Go to one, just show up and see what's up. If it ain't for you, cool. Or you can call me and ask me what's going on. 428409820. I tell you what's going on. 4028409820. 4028409820. Call me. I'll let you know what's going on. 4028409820. I'll let you know. Hook me up on Facebook. U-turn on Facebook. You oh, okay, all right. Community event. Yeah, community community event with U-turn. Go to U-turn page. You go to U-Turn page. You're on our volunteer list. Yeah. We we'll do community events. Uh, I, you you hang out with me, something. you be in the bus. <laughs> I got a bus. You better tell them about the bus. They don't know. They got the wrong preacher. I'll be out there. I want to thank, I, I'm going to be honest with you. I've seen you turn Of course, I know Sister Judith. And I really didn't know the specifics about what you've done. Me being a clinical therapist, I've worked with some of the same kids that you've worked with, but on a different level. But not talking about that, um, just you coming here sharing your story, especially you, you know, um, Brother Devers. We're cut from the same cloth. And I've been a member of this church ever since I was 10 years old. Mm -hmm. Your life, and our, I'm just a female. Mm -hmm. So everything that could happen to a woman happened to me. But you know what's so interesting? When I share my experiences in this church, some people cringe. They don't want to hear it because that's not who you are. That's not who you are today. I'm not sharing it for you. <laughs> it's so I remember Vietnam projects, hilltop projects. I remember Tommy Rose Garden. I remember all those different names and all that. Millions didn't make it, but we were some of the ones who did. And the harder it was for, we to, for us to get here, the more that we owe. Yeah. So I'm thank you. Thank you, Sister Judith, for bringing him in because this is real. You think it can't happen to your kids. And I know you've worked with mine, Bakari. He's still, he's still Bakari Hunt. He's still doing his thing. I don't mind saying. But my sons were here too little growing up. And it's very interesting. Sometimes in the body of Christ, we point the finger at other people's kids until it happened to yours. And then we want everybody to wave the flag and come. But wait a minute. It's before that occurs. And we do have to be honest and real. And our, our, again, I'll speak to our Sabbath school lesson when it's talking about mission. Thank you for saying that. I said that this morning in Sabbath school. We're not talking to, to people about Jesus. Not right now. We're just introducing ourselves. But I just want to thank you. And that's just an act of God that you're here. And we know a mutual young man. 
10 to 15 years and you said that a shooter is out and but I believe that it's God's providence to save him and I'm glad that he is where he's at and where he's going so we all play a part I don't care what we do the harvest is plenty but the laborers are few but I just want to thank you and I, I, th I know a lot of your people you got so much family it's crazy the Devers, no oh so many I think you I think you got some in this audience right now I think you got some cousins here but anyway just God bless you and your work and the ladies I just want to that you're doing with the women so just thank you oh and you do an awesome Bernie Mac impression uh, <laughs> you're doing impressions now you're, doing, you're impersonator now and, and Miss Joyce I knew you were coming but chill what <laughs> now go with your question chill what? I, I just no, because she said Bernie Mac. You know how clownish I am. So you and I, know. Know. I mean, we work together at DCYC. <laughs> I know you a clown, but I know you about your business oh, too. Yeah. You know, and you a God fearing man. And God, you know, when you came in the youth center, you you kept it one hundred. When you came there your first day, and we laughed and laughed and laughed, and we've been brothers and sisters ever since. Um, and you know my son Tommy. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so you know. Um, and I tell people all the time, even being a clinician, the work that I do, I tell the kids, especially our black kids, I tell them all the time, don't get caught up with the cars, the houses, the degrees, because we have the struggles too. We have the struggles too. We have kids, and I tell their parents too, mom, you're sitting here next to your son. I've been that mom as well. I've been that mom as well. Um, and I'm not exempt. I'm not exempt because I have a master's degree. I'm not exempt because um, I go to Sharon Seventh-day Adventist Church and I try to attend every week and do all the things that I'm supposed to do and I give and I give and I give and people are like, oh, you're so nice. And I'm like, no, it's nothing but God. It's nothing but God. I drive with heavy favor on my cars because God gives me favor. God has given me favor. He's given my child favor who's been shot three times. Three times. Not a bone broke, not a vessel, not anything. And he's still walking and he has three sons of his own that he's raising. And I'm helping raise, you know, with the help of God, you know. And I tell people every day, we are the testimony. We are the bulletin boards of life of real true life and how God wants us to be, you know, every day. You know, so I appreciate all the work that you do. I appreciate working with Judith. I appreciate growing up with Judith, you know, not growing up with her side by side, but her being a mentor for me to look up to, you know, and other people in the church, you know, and we have to understand and know that our stories are tests our stories and we need to tell them to people to our people because they think that we haven't had struggles because of the things that we have and these things that we have we can't take them with us we can't take them with us your bank account your nice house your nice clothes I've had people say oh I like that shirt do you want it I've given the shirt off my back to someone I've given someone my winter coat I mean, one of the kids at the school, it was snowing like blizzard. And I was like, baby, where your coat at? And she said, I don't got one. And they said, you gave her that nice coat? I said, why not? And they said, well, her mom's probably gonna wear it. Well, she probably needs it too, whatever. I'll get another coat. Cause that's the God in me. And that's the way I was raised because my grandparents were service people. They serve people. And because I was like, where I get all this from? <laughs> all this being nice and giving. My grandparents on both sides, my mom's side and my dad's side. My grandfather on my dad's side was a preacher. I know your brother too. Right. And, and then my aunts. All of us do service work. Every last one of us, service work. My mom, everybody to give, to help people. And that's what we need to get back to. When I tell people all the time, we need to get back to the basics. Like you said, cook a dinner, fellowship. You know, helping each other. 
you know, if you got a dollar to give, give that dollar. Could you, you ain't imagine, give could 10? you imagine, could you imagine, and I just, it just hit me. Could you imagine sharing 70 events, having a barbecue out, out back only for, watch this, watch this, high risk individuals. The average can come, but we want the high risk. Can we, I, I'm thinking all kinds of times because cause these guys don't know when real men, I talk about being a real man. I learned how to be a man by the grace of God. I ain't had no, I ain't, I ain't had no uncles when I was growing. I had them two step daddies. And my daddy dead, so I can't go dig him up out the grave. But I raised f three boys. I raised three boys. I have four, but I raised three. So I'm thinking like, what if we just had a barbecue for just high risk individuals, boys and girls? And we just have some grills, some dogs, throw some darts, have some conversation. I mean, I'm, cause, cause that's what the church for. Huh? Some cornhole. Yeah, yeah, don't, yeah. <laughs> Tic Tac X, yeah. Okay, I'm gonna come. I got a couple of questions. Miss Julie, you ain't, I, I ain't got you. I'm I'm glad y'all brothers are here. You know, you know, listening to your story. You know, I was raised on 41st and Pinckney. So I saw them come in. But, you know, when they came in, I was already there doing what I do. Because I come from a family that's from here. Whatever. I'm a second generation. You know, I seen my uncles go in and out of the prisons. I seen uncles get murdered. I seen my aunt, listen to my aunt get, be murdered by just uh, domestic abuse. But it didn't stop me from going out there, you know. I got wound on my body. I took a life. I lost a son behind gang violence. And I still have family members out here. I only been in the church, but I've been told, maybe a year and a half, two years. But I have a trail behind me and trying to turn that around. You know, as you said, who's talking to them? For years, I wasn't talking to them. I wasn't telling them what was going on out there. Let you find out for yourself. You know, like you said, I still see the brothers on Baffert Street. You know, Uncle Brian, Uncle Brian, you my uncle. Because I've been there all my life. You know, so, yeah, I need to get back I need to get out here because I do owe, you know? I took a life too, you know? I sold the drugs on the street and everything else. Like, hey, that's what we do. My uncle, I had plenty of male bottles that didn't do it, but they didn't have them. That's how I look at it. Some of them went to church, right here in this church when it was safe, you know. So I'm just grateful that you're here. So appreciate Thank you. you. Thank you. you. Yes, I like to think uh, you guys, uh, a while back y'all had a, a pet uh, zoo up that U-turn and y'all had a dance contest for the girls and I like to Thank the young lady because she was making sure none of the kids do the, the kind of dance that they normally do. My daughter and I was up there. They had a, um, a, a what is that, a, a jumping beam where they jump in and everything, but you also had information about other things. And I like to thank the Lord because I had been talking to my husband. I said, you turned being on my mind for two years, two years. And the other day I had called, and I think uh, I, I 
I think I dialed the wrong number or something. I said, oh, something's going to happen. And then I looked at the flyer, and I said, U-turn going to be here. I said, I'm going to get involved more with U-turn. And I talked to a lady about it about a month ago, and she said, what is U-turn? I said, it's a lot of people of, of us color trying to get our people to love each other better and do better. And it's an outreach for people who need help. Now, just because it's more of us color, it doesn't mean that we won't help out other nationalities that need us. So I'm glad you're here because I'm going to volunteer and support it. Anything I have to do, y'all will hear me on y'all answer machine Monday. <laughs> <laughs> All right, thank you again. We I definitely, appreciate it. We definitely can give you some direct numbers so you call us and we can get you uh, hooked up with our uh, community liaison. Is that 933 7850? Right. 933 7850 is the main number. We've got one last uh, comment. This will be your last question. I'm yes, sorry. Yes, ma'am. I just wonder what resources. I have one more after you. Then oh, we're okay. <laughs> what resources do you have for the children? where the, the problem they have is in their home. You know, how do you help them through that when they have to go home to? We got, we got a wraparound service. Like, for instance, uh, we work with other organizations. I just can name one off the top of my head that deals with 12 to 25 year olds. The YES program. You know, when you gotta go home, yeah, YES, Youth Emergency Services. They got, they got shelters, they got, um, um, they got home placement. That's just one of them, of many that connect what's going on in the home. Whatever the kids want to deal with what's going on in the home, if it's anger issues or it's, it's parents, uh, again, that's getting high off drugs. Now, how do you deal with that going home every day? You open up that young person to an avenue to somebody that can reach out to help. Uh, another one that's come to mind is on 20, on uh, uh, Center Street. Which one is that? We just left. Center Street. Reconnect. 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 And then just, just, to, just to piggyback off what Ron said, if, if an individual might, <clears throat> might be having issues in the home and they might not be high risk and not fit the, our criteria, we still will go uh, meet with that parent, uh, assess the situation, uh, and with uh, knowing all the community programs that we that we work with we'll go assess and, and make that warm handoff to uh, the program that's suitable for that that situation uh, I appreciate you guys this presentation and I'll tell you uh, uh, Hill, I've been wanting to um, pull you aside and ask you about u-turn because I had no idea what u-turn was about and I have seen your signs out in the community and I was always wondering what it is that you guys do, and I appreciate you guys coming out here today and uh, enlightening us as a church and as a, a community. Um, you have made a comment during your presentation about you being raised in an environment of some of, of violence and the fact that your father had died and your stepdad was violent towards you. And now that you are older, you moved to uh, Sioux City, you married, and you have, you said, three sons. And I'm just wondering for you, having come up in that type of environment, what blueprint are you using then now to be a father to your sons and to try to keep them? Because we know as parents, no one is exempt from what they can do. They can choose, they, they, they make their own choices and they live and die by their choices. But what blueprint then as a dad and something that you may share with other uh, young men that are coming up that may have children, that they can be a, a, a father because I know uh, some years ago there was a Father for a Lifetime program. I'm not sure what other programs are out there, but um, if you can just share that, because I would appreciate it. Yeah, one of the things that helped me, I had a belief system. I have a belief system mm -hmm. that, that I live out. It's Christ. It's the center of my life. That's my belief system that, that allows me to do certain things. I, I, I raised my, my four kids in my home. On, 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 on what we call uh, standards. Keep it real, keep it clean, keep it honest. All my kids know that. I didn't make them go to church. They went to church because that's what I did. So I didn't make them get in the choir. If they didn't want to get in the choir, that was cool. 
But we going to church because this is my belief system. I put God first. My son watched me work. Both of them. Both of them work right now today. You know, so I would tell them, you know, a man, it's, you got to have a belief system that you can create values off of. And then you got to live bound. You got to live bound. You know, like I say all the time, you know, I, I, I got my own wife. I don't need yours. I don't got a job. I'm going to work for a living. You ain't got to give me nothing. My sons watch me. They, the lights ain't never been out. Been food in the refrigerator all, all the time. My son told me that day, he said, yeah, we always had something. May not have been what I want, but we had something. And they saw me leave every day and go to work. So it's your belief system and being able to live that out. That's why I tell, any, I tell anybody that. Not, I think to add on to uh, my brother uh, Ron was saying <clears throat> that belief system, the values, uh, but being the, the, the model, you know, uh, when I was young, my, like I mentioned, my dad had passed away when I was 13, but I saw my uncle get up rain, sleet, or snow to go to work. I don't care what the condition was, he was going to work. And that always stuck with me. So I tell young people, I work with a lot of young adults, and for young men, getting up being productive every day. Because we, we live in the more control era to where we all know if, if your woman is going to work every day and the bills is on her shoulders and, you, and she come home and you just playing video games, that's an unhealthy relationship. You ain't no good in that relationship. You ain't no good in that relationship. You ain't no good to yourself because now you, you feeling sorry for how your life going. Now you want to get high, you want to drink. You want to drown yourself in sorrow. You ain't no good to yourself. You ain't no good in that relationship. You go in the community. Some guys get it how they live it. Now they turn to thieving and, and robbery and backstabbing. So I tell young men all the time, get up, be productive. Build off something. Build off something. One thing I always tell them, and they, they have a hard time filling this out, you never know yourself as long as there's some food around. You go up there and tight rope, on that tight rope, you acting a fool because you know that safety net down there. Let that safety net be gone and you're back against that wall over there and you don't know where your next check coming from. That's a dangerous person. That's a dangerous person and I can know. Thank you. Would you please give these two gentlemen a Sharon, thank you. Thank you. Yes, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, it was my intention that we were going to be done at 530. And I take no responsibility for the fact that we went over because the conversation was good. You know what? God is good. You know, pastor talks all the time about this whole thing of ministry. You know how sometimes we think the only person got the word is us. The only folk going to heaven is us. The only people out here saving souls is us. The only people out here know the Bible is us. The only people out here, uh-uh. See, that's two men right there. Huh? Yeah, that's two men right there that are out here on a ministry, on a mission every single day. So I just want to thank you so much for being willing to be open to this program, to be hearing the information. Listen, that was three of probably 50 programs out here that we could invite into this church and that would share information with us and tell us about how we can get meaningfully engaged in a different way in the community that we say we love so much with the word that for many of us have been in our hearts and we've been learning it since we were too big, all we could say is Jesus wept. And now here we are, we are mature men and women. And God has given us an opportunity through our pastor. I got to give you all the credit in the world. I used to wonder what he'd be doing over there at Bethesda because they was always somewhere. You know, Bethesda's always out there somewhere. But you know what? It's because he took the leadership. And so my prayer is that, that the connection and that the love that he has for getting us involved in the community is going to see us moving and operating in a much different way. Again, thank you so much for being here. God bless you real good, and I pray that you've heard something.
Hallelujah. I pray that you've heard something this evening that you'll be able to take away with you and that you'll be able to make a significant impact in our community. As I said, I left uh, you. Someone said you needed a microphone. Preacher's voice, okay. Uh, but being a part of the, just in case you don't know, let me kind of give you the history of, and I'll even give you the real history. There was a coalition about 10 years ago that was trying to get together because the Nebraska and Creighton University was putting together a thing that they wanted to use faith-based groups to push medical uh, health because we found out something, as I shared with you, is this. Uh, we rank probably in the top 10 just about on every category when you talk about AIDS, when you talk about, uh, we used to call it VD. Um, what they call it now? Okay. What? STI, okay. The new thing, STI. Uh, well, no, we rank. We, uh, Northeast Omaha, we rank in the top 10. I'm talking about the country. We rank in the top 10. Now you think about it, as small as we are, we have the highest percentage of sexually transmitted disease, diabetes, hypertension, all of these things. So what happened before I got here, uh, both medical schools were challenged. How can they help the Northeast Corridor of Omaha? Well, I was only here for two years before, well, no, actually three years, before they were asking this question. And all because this church did not respond. Bethesda got in at the 11th hour. Of uh, who's that, Dr. Sikok Sakoki? Uh, uh, which, which Judith? She knows. Uh, she was looking for a church. We had eight. Well, it was seven. And Sharon was asked. Sharon did not respond. I jumped in, and it's been, I mean, the Lord has blessed. I mean, we had the first here in Omaha. We used our gymnasium there. We had the first exercise program that they paid us $7,500 per year to do that. And so from that end, from then on, I just got on the wheel and everything in the world that comes down the pike, I get it done, I find out who it is. I now sit on as a co-sponsor for the health department faith-based group there. And so it's only but God's grace there. And so Whatever's out there, I'm trying to get it here so that not only that, how many were blessed this evening? There are ways, like these brothers, I already told them. I said to me, I don't mind sponsoring you brothers because God is already at work. I'm not, you know, my church doesn't have to do that. They're doing it there. And I'll even tell you, when I was at Bethesda, Omaha Street School, we sponsored them every month because we believe God is doing something that we wasn't doing. They were taking at-risk kids and they graduate them. And so what we did, we took over their breakfast program for the whole year. So I'm hoping that we can be engaged with our community because I'm going to tell you, once they know you, you can get things done. But when you're up there, and I always say this, if I'm friends with them, Jesus will come. Jesus will come. But if I show them I'm able to help out, work out with them, then the Lord bless. So I'm hoping we can do that. I'm hoping just like I, uh, what was Sister uh, uh, Lotus? Um, Kisa, yeah, okay. I was already out there with her. I said, listen, we're going to have to sit down because I said, now true enough, I don't have a women's ministry program. But I said, I need you to be a part of it there. And she said, well, get it on. Let's go with it. And I said, okay. Because I do know we can use that kind of help there. We can use it. We can definitely use it there. All right, sis, do you have anything you want to present? 
Okay. <laughs> okay. Our address is, what is it, 3336? Yeah. And it's seventh day? Seven? Yeah, okay. yeah. So, let's see. The third woman who signed in today is Sister Arliss. Sister Arliss Blakely, would you please stand? Come on now. <laughs> Patrick, Patrick. Patrick. Patrick Hyden. Patrick. He's not gone. Okay, we're going to remember Chuck. Patrick. It's six. Sister Linda Green. All right, Sister Green. There's Patrick right there. There's oh, Patrick. Patrick. I've seen death come as a result because someone failed to manage their diabetes. It does sadden me when my own congregation is suffering from diabetes because it's preventable. I believe taking charge of your life means being aware of your own health, getting professional advice, and then executing those things that have been provided for you. I'm Pastor Bobby Waters, and my health does matter.